Welcome families. Welcome to James Jordan Middle School. We are we want to present ourselves to you through this virtual format. My name is Mrs. Lara. I'm the principal here at James Jordan Middle School. I have been here for um, over 11 years now. I have been a math teacher in the past for the school and through different opportunities through the career ladder. Um, now I'm the principal of the school and we, I welcome you all. Mrs. Guerrero. Hi. I'm, hello families, my name is Mrs. Guerrero. I'm the assistant principal for school climate. Um, this is my 10th year at James Jordan. Similar to Mrs. Lara, um, through the career ladder, I started as a paraprofessional, taught uh, all subjects at James Jordan, and now as assistant principal, um, assisting with different pieces with Mrs. Lara. Absolutely, so we welcome you all. So welcome to our uh, 2021 school year as we're initiating our orientations for this for this upcoming school year. Traditionally, orientations would be in person and we would require parents to come onto our campus. But as I mentioned, due to COVID-19, we have a lot of important information to share with you through this video. So we will continue. We are a small independent charter school. We are another toys. Uh, small in the sense that we are a uh, we have no more than 420, 25 students, 420, 20 to 425 students um, in our past couple of years, and that has been our enrollment cap. So it makes us very small compared to other middle schools. We're an independent charter school. What does that mean? Uh, that means that the district, we are within the district boundaries. LEU is the inter authorizer, meaning that they um, do oversee some of the um, compliance pieces that our school does, but as far as a lot of the decisions that we make, um, we, are, we do so in an independent manner with our staff, with our parents, um, with other administrators as far as decisions that we make. We are an independent school. We don't um, depend on the district for funding. We are directly funded by the by the state and federal funding as well and all of those decisions that we make on and our student programs they're all done in an independent manner based on the student needs we are another choice there are several charter schools in our area um, yet we are going to use um, the this this video to, to show you and to share with you what makes us so different uh, we were at california distinguished school in 2019 which is an amazing accomplishment for our school that we are very proud of um, to really show the the growth and to show that um, you know our school and our teachers and our staff are putting in work and thought um, into into everything that they do to ensure that your students and our our students uh, in general are academically uh, successful and they and they are improving improving the time that they are with us. So we will continue. So our school has three pillars. Uh, this, is, this goes in line with our mission and vision. So we have character, college, and community. I will begin with character. Uh, character for us means we, we build your students' character. We know that they are coming from different schools and they're coming into an environment in where you know we, we are very strict. Mrs. Gunder will talk more about our discipline system and our expectations. Uh, yet we one of our models is do, do what is right, not what is easy because we know sometimes that is very difficult, but we always do what is right now, what is easy as we are facing challenges. We want to develop our students, um, you know, in, in, within a mindset that they have this desire to attend a four-year college or university, okay? That's, that's our, one of our goals as we're building their character in that mindset. College, our next motto is these don't get you degrees. Um, and Mrs. Guerrero will also discuss a little bit more about our grading system and what, what that means and how that's different from other schools. Um, one of the quotes that we always love to share during our orientation is the one that I have projecting here is be courageous enough to dream and educated to make those dreams come true from Caprice, Caprice Young. I think that really captures what we want um, our students to do. You, I want my own children to do as I do have children myself and we want to make sure they're able to, to get to college. The last full cycle in, in our three pillars is community. You don't have to like anybody but you will respect everybody and of course looking at the big picture thinking of 
you know, once your students build that character, go to college, we want them to come back to their community and do great things um, and, and rebuild communities and give back to their community. So we want to encourage that from our students um, to always um, have that, that, that mindset um, because together we're, we're changing the communities that we all come from. All right, so the objective of our presentation is going on from the pillars that Mrs. Lara just explained, um, community, making sure that all of our stakeholders are involved in our community. So here you can see some images of some of our students um, started off at James Jordan, had graduated, graduated high school, went off to college, and now are part of our um, JGMS family. So. Um, you will see that we also have uh, alumni that come back and help us out and volunteer um, through sports, um, different tasks that we need help with on campus. Um, we've seen the involvement of families where we see very little young ones come through with their older siblings. And then five, six, seven years later, they are now part of our school family. So it's really important to know that um, when we need community, community is seen at James Jordan Middle School. Um, our staff, um, and you see the image, we are um, a larger staff, but not as big as the district, but definitely we all um, come together and see what are some of the best practices that can be used in making sure that all students get the best education. Thank you, Mrs. Guerrero. We will continue. All right, so um, incoming students are expected to. So I'm gonna give you some of the basic information that we have all of our incoming students um, meet some of the criteria. So we expect them to read at least 30 minutes daily. Uh, we expect the kids to also have memorized their math, math facts. They should be able to answer um, 100 basic multiplication and division facts in less than four minutes. So there is an assessment that we give the students um, and see how fast and how accurate they can complete their basic um, math operations. We also have um, an expectation of having a three to five er paragraph essay being written for, from students and also making sense of problems and perse per persevere in solving them. And we know that there are challenging tasks that will come about and making sure that our kids do not give up and make sure that they find and use the resources that we provide in order for them to persevere through this challenge and move forward. Absolutely. And of course, we also have, um, you know, expectations and information for incoming parents because there are some pieces of that as well that we are very transparent and wanna share with you. Um, we can't do this without you. This means that you know, in a regular school year, a lot of our information here is in a regular school year as we are definitely looking at what will the future look like for 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 um, education and bringing kids back on campus. So, you know, with with that assumption that we will be able sooner than later be able at some point um, under the guidance of, of health officials and other 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 um, departments that we work with to give us a clear at one point to bring kids back on campus. We also have, you know, this these expectations from our parents as it pertains to our parking lot, um, and we want to be able to share these with you as well under this format too. So we, the, the number one thing is be patient uh, when we get to the point of you dropping off the students physically on campus or you picking up your students. So please be patient in a parking lot. Um, we know that at times, you know, parents come through our drive-through or the, our, our lanes. Um, and we will share that with, with the official um, in one of our first general meetings once we kick off the school year to discuss those things. Yet we want to make sure that, that our community knows to be patient and our families know that. Um, because at times they might get a little congested, but we want to make sure that we have that as an agreement. Be an active partner in your child's education. What does that mean? That means that you speak to the teachers and administration if there is a problem. Um, or you can have general questions. We've had parents in the past who just want to know how their students are doing. That's completely appropriate. Um, we've had at times, you know, uh, face certain challenges with students, or we see that the students need a particular support. 
don't ignore your phone calls, don't ignore text messages, don't ignore emails. That's what being an active partner means in all of this in, in your child's education. Um, we encourage you when we can to attend events, field trips, meetings. Um, a lot of our meetings right now are virtual. We're very proud to say uh, that during our meetings, we have um, over 150 participants, which is a great number to have um, during our general parent meetings. So we just ask that you continue to join those meetings. Um, be present when there are concerns about your child's performance, as I kind of already mentioned, as well as behavior is the one I wanted to touch upon. Sometimes we may contact you about their academic performance and, and discuss those pieces. Sometimes we'll discuss their behavior, that uh, character portion that I previously touched upon. Make sure that you check their homework and sign their agenda every night. In a traditional school year, uh, you would be doing this, um, uh, checking their agenda, an agenda that we issue our families where our students get in the habit of writing their homework down on a daily basis to keep them organized um, throughout the week. We would love for you to volunteer, uh, donate when whenever possible, um, as we have different events and different activities that we plan throughout the school year. We love to engage our parents in, the, in you know, we know that you all work, uh, some of you do, some of you don't, um, yet we, there's different ways, uh, different, point, um, different points in time where you can engage and be an active participant in our school. Thank you, Mrs. Lara. So we've talked about the expectations for students. We talked about the expectations for parents and now the expectations for staff. So what you should expect from a JJMS staff member. We provide the high quality, all data-driven instruction of the Common Core standards. We have clear documentation of your student's current grade level. We make sure that your, your child writes his or ho uh, her homework in their agenda that Ms. Lara just uh, mentioned. We provide tutoring at least two days a week uh, during lunch. Teachers are available to meet with parents before school, during school, after school. Um, until four by appointment. Administration, we're available to meet uh, with you before school during the day up to six o'clock or even Saturdays by appointment. Um, we have multiple opportunities for additional academic support. We have Saturday school, we have winter session, spring intercession, and at the after school uh, program and summer school. Um, some of the educational tools and technology that we have on uh, for students is uh, clear, clear documentation of your student's current grade level. Every child is issued an agenda. Every child has access to a computer and hotspot. Every child um, has an issued JGMS domain email. Sixth graders are introduced to touch typing. So by the end of eighth grade, students can type. Um, we set goals throughout uh, each grade level and the majority of our students meet those typing goals. Uh, curricular, uh, curriculum is consistent offline of online work and traditional workbooks. So we have both. We have curriculum that is completely online and we have curriculum that is uh, that re requires students to work off a book. And then of course our free after school program and Saturday school tutoring support that is available for all students. Thank you, Mrs. Guerrero. Continuing on. So we always, we're very data driven. What does this mean for us? Uh, this means that we also get to share this data with our families. Um, we know that uh, 1920 um, did not end the way that we planned uh, the school year 2019-20, uh, and that's when we started our distance learning programs. And um, you know, we we the state of California decided not to test students for the state testing. What I have here to show you is the state testing for 1819. Uh, which we are very proud of and we is one of the the metrics that we use to share with our families and our stakeholders and incoming families for you to really get a get information be better informed about how to speak on behalf of their child's school regardless of what school they attend i think this is key information um so looking at james Durant middle school in 1819 in ela in in the the exam for english language arts all of our students, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, the entire school, looking at the entire school, our students were able to achieve 
54.73% of our students met or exceeded um, the standards for, for EOA. That is fantastic. We, we celebrated this. We still celebrate this, and we hope that we were able to continue this work. In math, 58.57% um, of our students met or exceeded these standards for mathematics, which is also an amazing accomplishment for our students and our staff. We are very proud of these numbers. Um, and this shows to have, you know, this is, this is why we do what we do. Uh, we do have high expectations of our students and our staff to get results like this. Uh, the dedication, the lesson planning from our teachers, um, you know, the, the, the way that we train our students and work with our students to get to know them so that they are able to achieve these accomplishments for themselves and, and for our school as a, as a learning community. I also want to show you a comparison of um, the closest uh, LAUSD middle school, which is um, Sutter, which is right up the street from us, John Sutter. Um, looking at their at, at their scores and looking at their school in ELA, they have 22.23% of their students uh, met or exceeded standards in ELA. And in math, 15.28% met or ex exceeded standards in, um, in math. So we're definitely able to compare ourselves. And again, I mentioned that we are an independent charter school, meaning that you know we really have to pay attention to to these results, as you know we 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 want to be able to show the work that we're doing on a day to day basis, and and the ending result are scores like this because parents trust us. You 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 make the choice to bring your student to our school. You trust us with your child's education, and 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 the and the. You know the pedagogy that our teachers have and use to ensure that you know we are putting them on the right track um, in all levels. And I say that in all levels because we've had in, in the start of sixth grade, the majority of our students are coming in in math at an 18 or 18 to 20 percent proficiency in math, and in ELA is about 30 percent. But by the time they leave us and just looking at the whole at the whole school, you know, we have jumped 15 up to 20 percent of growth. And that's the growth that we want to see. And that's the growth that our teachers and our staff, you know, they dedicate their time to ensure their students are, in fact, receiving a high quality education. Uh, let me show you a different graph as how we compare ourselves to other schools. This one's a little bit more in detail as not only do we, um, you know, pay attention to, you know, how well did we do, you know, the students who met and exceeded standards, but we also wanna look at what we call rank one, which is, you know, the students who um, are not performing at where, where they should be at grade level. And we want to make sure that that is reducing throughout time. So um, that number should be smaller throughout time. And, and what I have here to show you is, for example, in math, in 2019, uh, rank one lowest was 19.15%. Overall, LAUSD, 40.70% 40 of their students were at rank one. That is a huge number of students who are, who are at rank one. In the state is 34, looking at going back to Sutter, their rank one level, a percentage is 60, per, about 60% 60 of their students are at that rank one. And I can go on, you know, but and the other point I want to make is Lawrence um, with their gifted magnet, um, you know, thinking of, you know, a group of students who already know are high achieving, even within that, they have a good number of students who are already, who's, who are still in that rank one at 37.28%. Um, so this, these numbers really allow us to get a picture of the work that we're doing in comparison to other schools because we do have to compare ourselves to, and to ensure that we're providing you that information to make the choice. In ELA, we see some similar patterns as well. Um, our rank one in ELA was also about, around 19%, 19.85%. And then we're able to continue to see the trends and how we're comparing that rank one with other schools. Um, this, this graph also shows, or this data here shows, um, how we compare in that met and exceeding, as I, as I presented in that other graphic in the previous slide, um, and how we are comparing to other uh, neighboring schools and e even you know, we are definitely outperforming the local schools around us in both math and 
and at ELA. I know that we came really close to Lawrence and, you know, they are we're right, you know, right above them in the ELA area. And then we know that's looking at this data, we know that's definitely an area that we want to keep going um, to ensure that our students are able to perform. So this is important. This information is completely public. You are more than welcome to search um, the CASP website is what this is called, is the SBAC testing, the state testing, um, to ensure that you're well informed and, and knowing how your, how your students are doing currently, obviously the school they're currently attending, and you, know, you creating an opportunity for you to look at that data to decide what is going to, where, where are they going to go next? And how is that school doing? And how can we all uh, work together to ensure that um, our, our learning communities are in fact improving? We also have an after school program um, with, through the ACES grant. Um, traditionally, our after school program um, would, you know, would be on campus. Um, 3, 3.30 to 6.30 has been has been in the past traditional year hours. The data that I have here is for 18-19 as well, um, as the end of 1920 did not end as we planned, yet this is data to also show, you know, the, 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 the different efforts made even after a regular scheduled day, how we are assisting our students and our after school program um, has been um, pushing and ensuring that they are providing all the resources necessary for our students to be successful. Um, and this means, you know, work, what you're, what we're displaying here is the homework uh, completion uh, percentage um, as one of the metrics to demonstrate uh, that progress. And of course, that, that those, those efforts impact the way that our students perform in our day program. So you're able to kind of, you see some trends here throughout the school year in our sixth, seventh and eighth grade. And of course, all grade levels um, as the, the different resources are used within our after school program. Thank you, Mrs. Lara, for all the data. Moving on to more information about on, on campus. So when we are on campus, our school opens at 7.15 a.m and we close at 6.30 p.m. Um, let me give you some information about some of the uh, times for our class. So Monday through Thursday, um, class starts at 8.15 and ends at 3.30. There's a 30 minute break and a 45 minute lunch break. And then on Fridays is our professional development day for teachers. So students um, have an early day dismissal and that's at 1.30. So from 8.15 to 1.30 p.m. Same thing, the break is a 30 minute break and then a 45 minute lunch. Um, our after school program runs Monday through Thursday, 3.30 to 6.30, and then Friday from 1.30 to 6.30. Um, we also offer Saturday school and Saturday school is from 8.45 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. Um, we, our priority is safety at our school, so we make sure that at 7.15, when our gates open, we have two to three, four uh, adult staff members who are supervising kids and uh, making sure that everyone has breakfast and is ready to go for the beginning of class. Thank you, Mrs. Guerrero. Continuing on. Now, what we just went through is, is are the expectations or what we, what the program that we have when we're on campus. What we're running right now um, during the uh, 2021 school year, the current year that we're on right now is, as we're filming this, um, this is our distance learning schedule and expectation. In the event that we are to continue our distance learning schedule and expectations, we, we wanna make sure that we're transparent and we share these with you. Currently our class sessions are 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. every single day, Monday through Friday. There is a 30 minute break and about a 45 minute lunch between all our grade levels. Um, and it's all, it's all virtual learning. So distance learning, uh, sixth and seventh grade uh, students and within that grade level have the same teacher all day. So they one teacher will teach them their ELA, their math, their science, their history, and they have a separate PE teacher. For our eighth graders, uh, there are different teachers that teach them these content areas. They have a teacher for ELA, a teacher for math, a teacher for science, a teacher for history, and an instructor for PE. And of course, um, because we want to make sure our eighth graders are well prepared to move on to high school where, where they will have 
multiple uh, teachers. Our sixth and seventh graders were a little more flexible with that schedule as we're still working on that character. We're still working on some of the um, academic gaps that they that sometimes they come in with to ensure that you know for for the distance learning program that we have to ensure that that, that one teacher is able to focus um, in these different areas. A JGMS computer will be issued to new students and. Uh, we do expect that the camera must be on during instruction. I know that um, some schools don't require that. We do as part of our culture building. Um, we want to make sure that we assimilate and um, the idea of being online and, and having a virtual classroom feels you are present with your camera on. In class, we would not allow someone walking in with a hoodie and we kind of take that analogy in the same way as you having your camera on. I should be able to see your entire frame and you should be ready to go. So you wanted to go through some of those expectations. Um, in the event that we have to continue under distance learning, um, of course, a lot of any, any edits that we make to this, all of that information will be shared with our stakeholders, with our families and with our students. But we wanted to give you a little bit of what is it that we do under distance learning, um, given COVID-19 and this, pandem this pandemic, okay? So attendance, so we take attendance very, very seriously. Um, attendance is shown to, to some data that has been conducted, shows a correlation, a relation between, um, you know, how well a student's attendance is to their academic achievement. Uh, parents are expected to provide us with proper documentation when a student misses school. We're still expecting of that right now during our distance learning program. Parents are still calling in our main office, sending us emails, sending us text messages with, with such documentation. There are only a few legally excusable reasons for a child to miss school. Um, you know, of course, bereavement if, if, if someone, an immediate family member, um, you know, uh, you know, passes in the family, the student has a dentist appointment, a doctor's appointment. There are certain things that we, there are excusable reasons and our parent student handbook has a list of them. We wanna make sure that we're building good habits um, in regards to their attendance, meaning that now we're thinking of, of tardiness. Um, even with distance learning, you know, we're, we're sticking to the expectation that students should be on time. As I mentioned, through distance learning, the, the class, the session starts at nine o'clock and we expect students to be on at nine o'clock. Um, so we conducted numerous ways of parent contacts to correct um, such habits and get kids online on time. I mean, they're home, they're not commuting. So that's one of the examples. But on a regular school year, that's also an expectation to ensure that students are in fact um, on time and that we bring that to your attention if we see that become habitual. We want to prepare them for college. You know, if they're if they're tardy or late to a job or starting in college and, and off to a um, a career, you know, that their immediate supervisor is going is going to say something similar. You know, we are the immediate supervisors, the ones who are overseeing such such habits, and we have to correct that so that your students are well prepared and um, are able to achieve what they need to achieve. Um, Finals week, so we traditionally have final uh, finals week for every quarter. Um, their students, it's for an entire week that they have uh, finals. And what happens is we alert parents of when these finals weeks will happen for throughout the school year um, during our four quarters to ensure that parents prepare, you know, um, not to have any appointments during that one week. Um, each quarter to ensure that they're able to schedule those um, at different times, appropriate times throughout the school year. Otherwise, we will have to request that you provide us proper documentation. So the student is not at risk of failing a final if they don't show up. So we just wanna be clear with that. We offer, we, we partner, we have partnerships with different programs in regards to mental health. Um, some, several organizations who do support um, you know, students who might be struggling with tardiness or attendance habits, and, and all of those habits impact their academics, and we have different supports for that. So we work with Tarzana Treatment Center, um, and we work with, um, with them. They provide um, individual counseling, group counseling, they provide parenting classes um, throughout the school year, great workshops, 
and we involve those pieces as part of as part of um, an opportunity for our families. We also work with Bridges. They also provide individual counseling as well as group counseling for our students. Um, we work with USC, the School of Social Work and Counseling. Um, we do host interns from, from USC and they do work with our students um, and provide these supports, these mental health supports to support their, their academics. Um, and we also work with CSUN through their Department of Child Development and Social Work and we host interns from CSUN as well. Um, so we have a lot of different levels of support to ensure that um, our families have the different resources so that their students are successful and the focus is in the right, um, and it goes in the right, in the right direction, which is, which is our academics. Mrs. Gerardo? Thank you. So I will be discussing and giving, providing, a little, uh, providing a little bit more information about grades. So on a regular school year, this is what makes us different than other schools. We have grades A, B, C, and a no credit, an NC, okay? We do not have a D, we do not have F or fail um, at our school. If you remember a few slides at the beginning, Mrs. Lara said, Ds do not get you degrees in a university. So this is why we begin to prep our students now the D's are passing, they're not passing at James Jordan Middle School. So we have two math classes that our students will take, two uh, ELA uh, classes, English, English Language Arts, one Science class, one History class, and one Physical Education class. Um, students should expect about 30, to an hour, uh, 30 minutes to an hour of homework every night. Uh, and the reason for that is we, we know that the kids are focused, they're um, giving it 100% in class, so we don't wanna overwhelm them once they're at home. So it, uh, we set that expectation when they are at home for homework. And of course they have some resources they can use after school program, Saturday school that we can assist them with. Making sure that we always provide a classroom with a safe environment for their learning, okay? Also, here's other things that make us different than other schools. Some important dates. Uh, we have three weeks off in winter. Uh, so our winter break is three weeks. Our spring break is two weeks off, different than the district. Um, summer bridge program is four weeks long. And then our first day of school is August 16th. We're anticipating it to be August 16th. So put that on your calendars, it might change but traditionally has been this week in August. Dress code. So at James Jordan, we do wear, um, we have a dress code that students must follow. So our tops are shirts that have, uh, must have a collar, a button and a sleeves in plain gray or the official shade of burgundy, which is a very dark shade of, of, of red. So you can see on an image, we have pictures here of a student who is wearing a burgundy shirt, collared with buttons and tucked in. The bottoms, um, we have fitted pants, capri shorts or skirts, not a, just a skirt, that can be worn. They must be completely black and have no decorations or stripes. Faded black pants are not acceptable. Um, so that's really important um, to make a note of uh, what the students should wear and shoes, most importantly for safety purposes, all shoes must be athletic shoes. Um, they need to fit closely with laces or have the one inch Velcro to hold their foot in in case there's ever an emergency, the students have a secure shoe on. Um, and shoes must be fastened at all times and, and not uh, flop open. Jackets, sweaters, sweatshirts, jackets must be a solid gray, white, black, or burgundy. And the, they can have stripe, um, stripes, up, but it must be those colors, a combination of those colors. Accessories, we keep them in mind that has to be professional um, from head to toe. This is their work environment, so they need to always look professional. Um, we do offer what's free dress. Uh, free dress is a form of recognition. It's a reward that we give students. Um, we have different ways that students can earn a free dress through um, our quarterly awards. Students can um, receive free dress. They are sometimes on our student store. We do have a student store where students can purchase uh, different items and um, some of these items may include a free dress. So that day we do have a free dress 
uh, policy, dress code policy um, that must be followed. But that would be an exception on when students do not have to wear this uniform that you can see um, on these students um, pictured here. They always have to be tucked in. Very important students must be tucked in at all times. Uh, during breaks and lunch, we do give them a little bit more leniency. They can untuck. But once they come back, it is very important that they are prepared for class and they must be tucked in and ready to go. Uh, their PE dress code is uh, all athletic code, coat, clothing. It must be burgundy, black, or gray. So it's a t-shirt or shorts. Uh, we do have uh, an online, uh, Mrs. Lara, maybe you can help us out with the online purchases so they can uh, be informed of how we go about in selling those. Absolutely. We don't sell any of this, uh, the apparel of the dress code um, items that we mentioned on campus. Um, all of it happens through, you have the choice of purchasing, as you see here, this image, um, the burgundy collar shirt with or without logo, a burgundy or gray has to be a, uh, the collar shirt. Um, we also use a vendor called French Toast, and they completely create a a web page for our uh, community and you directly purchase from them. They have a selection of, of polos with the with the logo, e-t-shirts with the logo. All of these items are included on that um, on that website. So we, we don't sell any of this. You can go to Target, you can go to JCPenney, you can go to Sears and purchase some of these items. They don't, the polos don't have to have the logo. Um, we know that um, you know some families preferred it. It looks very professional. Yet um, you know you can find these these two colors in polos in different places. Um, we do want to ensure that you are careful with the pants, especially for the ladies, um, because leggings are not appropriate. It has to be um, the pants material has to be like a cotton, um, you know, most mostly material to ensure that it's. Um, that is appropriately fitted, so no no rule, no skinny jeans, no jeans is the rule for boys and for girls as far as pants. Um, we've always kind of suggested that kind of like the Dickies material uh, to ensure that our students have appropriate bottoms. Um, I, we've had students who wear shorts the entire school year, rain or shine, that's completely appropriate, um, as long as they are black and they're not jeans and they're well fitted on their waist. So we, we will, you know, we, we don't allow students to, to sag on their pants. It has to be fitted if they need, if they need a belt or anything like that, we will notify you to make sure they are well fitted and they are presentable. All of these pieces, again, are assuming that we are coming onto campus and we're presenting to you as if we, we are, and we're being very transparent with you. Um, through virtual learning, the, the only thing that we see is from here on up. So we would expect them to wear um, their polo or a JJMS shirt. Okay, in the colors that Mrs. Mrs. Guerrero um, addressed as far as the, the physical education when they have physical education. So, um, Ms. Guerrero has a little more information to you about our discipline system. And when we say it, we mean it. Go ahead, Mrs. Guerrero. Yes, so we do have a very strict discipline system. So we're letting you know right off the bat that we do sweat all the small stuff. So what does that mean? That means from the language that students speak um, in class, out of class, to their behaviors, something that may be considered very minimal at a different school. At our school, it's not very minimal. We do uh, set very high expectations for students. Um, we do have um, conflict resolution groups. We have therapy groups, individually, individual counseling. Um, students must act and speak like professionals at James Jordan. Um, our students may not carry cell phones on them. Uh, we do have a procedure for that where students would, if they decide to bring a cell phone onto campus, we would have a set location for them to leave it during class time. And then at the end of the day, they would pick it up. Um, our students uh, have not yet found the need to uh, lock up their, their bikes and skateboards. Uh, we do have a location for them to uh, leave all of their uh, Tra transportation um, items at our campus. Um, our students may not bring junk food onto campus. We do have a very strict policy. Um, anything with, that contains sugar in the first three ingredients are not acceptable at James Jordan. So we do encourage students to bring their own snacks, but it has to be 
there, it cannot contain sugar in the three ingredients and no peanut products, of course. Um, so we do have uh, different forms uh, that are filled out, uh, different ways of contacting parents, communicating with parents. If there is a situation with discipline um, in, in order to be able to come to a solution and we can better uh, uh, support the student. So these behaviors or um, these actions are not repeated. Okay, so our job is to make sure that these actions are uh, addressed, taken care of, uh, find a solution. So we do need that partnership with parents um, a lot of the time when it comes to discipline. Absolutely, and, and together, that character piece that we talked about mm -hmm. earlier is what will, through our discipline system is what we are creating together. It's, it's that character building and holding our students accountable um, so that they are growing growing up as young adults to come back to our community and do great things for our community. So we stick to it. Um, we've had parents in the past who say, you are so strict. You don't even let them do X, Y, and Z. We're definitely letting you know that we mean it. Um, and through this means, through our orientations in the past that we've had, you know, we, we, we do publicly state that we have a, a very strict discipline system that we, that we stick to and that we want to make sure that you understand you, there will be an opportunity for you to learn more about what does it look like and what kind of things, additional thing, things in the classroom are students expected to do. Um, that won't get them in trouble or they get themselves in trouble. Um, so we, we, you know, we, we want to make sure that we are, um, are very clear about that. Okay. But not just because we have a discipline, strict discipline system, it doesn't mean that we don't do fun things. So we have the doing what's easy, which is like kind of the portion of the model of our behavior modification system. Um, we also do the, have the doing what's right merits. So we have the demerits on the doing what's easy and the merits on the doing what's right. This means that your students get to earn merits and they get to spend them. It's like they have a point bank. So how do they earn merits? Meeting our academic expectations, behaving as professionals, working as a community, um, living up to the three pillars that we talked about, uh, community service, volunteering, um, all of these things earn the merits. There's many other ways for them to earn that they get to participate in a regular school year. On field trips to Magic Mountain, we've gone to the Getty Villa. We love to expose our students to college campuses. I can't say enough how, how eye-opening it is for a student who has never set foot on a college or university. And we wanna give them these uh, opportunities to, um, to set foot in a college or university so that they can really, um, you, know, you know, think about it and create that goal for themselves and have that mindset to go to college is just really exciting to give them that opportunity. So we definitely throughout the school year strive to give um, at least one field trip for sixth grade, seventh and eighth grade so that they have an opportunity to explore different universities. So usually our sixth graders stay local. We know they go to Cal State Northridge, you know, maybe CSU Channel Islands, pretty local. My seventh graders go a little farther, they kind of go to, um, they go to U, um, UCLA, USC. My eighth graders, we have gone, because I have gone with them, as far as uh, UC San Diego, UC Santa Barbara, Cal Poly Pomona, to just really give them a wide variety of campuses so that they become interested um, in, in, in um, college and getting them there. Um, so those are some of the examples. We also have dances. They're in middle school, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. You know, just because we're a small school, we, we still have a dance room for our Halloween dance or Valentine's Day. Even through virtual learning, we create a breakout room that becomes our, our, our DJ room. So we try to do different things to engage our students in these doing what's right things and events. Uh, we have different festivals. We have, um, we usually on campus, we would have our, our winter festival that would be our pajama day. We ha we've had a spring egg hunt. We have special food rewards that your students can earn through merits. Uh, we've had in and out all kinds of different McDonald's, Slurpees, all kinds of different eateries, and much, much more. Um, a lot of what we are doing now through virtual learning, our merit store is online. So a lot of the things we get to mail home. But if we were on campus, all of the things that I described here would be very typical, okay? Um, as of course, it pertains to middle school, because you want to make sure just because we're very, very strict, 
We also have all kinds of fun opportunities where your, the students who are doing what's right can definitely um, earn those merits and, and, and enjoy these activities. So, Mrs. Guerrero? Yes. On here, we have additional images on, of uh, on-campus activities. So, we have flag football. We do have sports. We've um, taken a few championships uh, for different uh, sports, volleyball, flag football, basketball. Uh, we also have color guard. Uh, we have some recognition for color guard. Also, we have robotics um, and uh, Students take uh, different field trips. Um, Mrs. Lara, help me out. What is the field trip they go off for camping? Astro camp. Astro camp, yes. Yes, they have they uh, have a special um, event where students go to astro camp. And we also have activities throughout the year where it's staff versus students. And it's really, really fun for all of us to come as a community and just enjoy um, outside of the academics. Um, so it's really important to bring that balance to students and our kids enjoy it. It's lots of fun, like I mentioned, not for the adults too. So um, here are some images of field trips also uh, that students uh, have taken. And uh, again, uh, we, we, we balance everything out for the kids. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so now that we have presented to you all this information, I know that a lot of you are very anxious to know, okay, well, what happens after I receive this? You're in the middle of filling out our a virtual uh, lottery application and before you get to move on there is one more piece that we want to share with you and these are important deadlines so lottery time frame the first online lottery application deadline is due friday march 12 before 10 p.m this the first deadline is if you would like to participate in having your name just like this image here be placed your your students name be placed in a box so that we can you can participate in this lottery. Um, it is due by Friday, March 12th before 10 p.m. So if you continue after this video to complete our online lottery application and you hit submit, you have submitted it as long as you do it before Friday, March 12th, and we will include your child's name into our first public um, lottery, which will take place on Saturday, March 13th at 10 a.m. via Zoom. Um, all of this information will be shared publicly, we will be posted on the school website, on our calendar of events to, to um, create the Zoom meeting for you to participate and anxiously wait to see if your student is accepted to our school or they are going to be part of our wait list, okay? Mrs. Guerrero, can I have you cover the second application lottery. Yes, we have a second online application lottery lottery deadline, which will be Friday, June 4th, before 10 p.m. So very similar to what we did on the first lottery, you would uh, complete your form online, click submit. As long as it's before 10 p.m., your submission is in. The following day, Saturday, June 5th at 10 a.m., we will have our second virtual public lottery via Zoom. So what does this mean? This means that you don't have to apply twice. If you meet the first deadline, if you meet the March 12th deadline, you submitted your, your virtual lottery application form, you are watching this video you, and, and it's done. You will be part of that March 13th um, lottery, public lottery. This, the blue the section is for those families who for whatever reason forget about the first deadline and they missed the Friday, March 12th deadline. And now automatically you will have to submit your application by the next de second deadline, which is Friday, June 4th. So we always create this. I can tell you um, already, let me move on to our next slide here, that um, you know we, we always, the past four to five years, we've had a wait list. That means that from the first lottery, we already know we were able to pull all the necessary numbers um, that of, of capacity that we have of seats for that school year for that for certain grade levels, and we're able to have an I have the the that public for families to know who was admitted and who's in the waitlist. So, what is a lottery? 
an online application with an indicated time period so we previously talked about will be eligible for a public lottery. The list of accepted students on waitlist order is based on the results of the lottery, as I mentioned. Only a few exceptions are priority on the waitlist, which are described as you continue taking uh, completing this online lottery application. So a lot, one of the big questions is, well, how many students are you talking about? We anticipate approximately 140 to 145 students um, as a class of 2024. So this is for sixth grade. We anticipate 140 to 145 students that we will be able to admit. If you're not part of that 140 or 145, you will be added to that wait list. And we go down exactly as they come out. Um, we make three attempts of phone calls and you know to, to offer the CDB if it becomes available. Um, at times we've been able to use the the um, the wait list, you know, we've used 20 numbers, the first 20 numbers, sometimes we've used up to the to 50 numbers. It depends on how families um, feel and decide to accept in different times of the school year. So once you're on the wait list, we cannot guarantee you a spot. Um, but I always say, you know, it's better to have a plan and you stay on the wait list if your number comes up. Um, so uh, for, for those of you who are interested in seventh and eighth grade, um, honestly, uh, this past school year, we, we didn't uh, accept any new students really um, as all of our students decided to come back to the school. So it all depends on their intent to return as seventh and eighth graders. So we have, we still build a wait list for seventh and eighth grade. We still publicly have that posted on our school website, yet we rarely use our seventh and eighth grade list, uh, wait list. So we wanna make sure that, you know, we inform you about, you know, we welcome everyone to be on the wait list because you never know. Sometimes families move mid-year and we have a spot available. So that's how this works. Um, uh, one of the other things I wanted to mention is, um, in the, as I mentioned, the past four to five years, in the first lottery, we were able to fill this 140 to 145 students that we needed for sixth grade. In the events that we don't, what would happen, let's say I only have, I have 140 spots only, and 135 families apply. That means I have under the 140 that I need on the first lottery, everyone gets in. That's not what's happened in the, the past four to five years. The, po the, the past four to five years, we've had more applicants than the spaces that we had available. Therefore, we have to have a public lottery. Um, so I just kind of want to prepare you for those scenarios. So everyone needs to, apply, uh, needs to apply and complete this online lottery application, including um, the siblings of students or, or um, the kids of staff and, and um and other stakeholders that, as our as our exception of priority uh, priority on the wait list explains, um, so everyone goes through the lottery process. All this information um, will is on our school website. You can review it. If you have any additional questions, you can contact us. But we are very excited. Um, we hope that this video is helpful to get you an idea about our school and that you're able to make the choice uh, to apply and continue. Um, with this process uh, to become a JGMS Phoenix. So with that, we thank you, Mrs. Guerrero, closing remarks. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed our presentation. Um, there's a lot of information, but we are always helpful. Help, we are always welcoming your questions and take uh, any emails, uh, calls, and uh, we will answer those questions if you ah, oh, there's something that they mentioned and I wanna make sure that I, I understand it or clarification, we're here to help you. Um, and that's it, have a wonderful rest of the day. Hope to see you soon. Don't forget those deadlines. Thank, Thank you. you.